Hey, what's up? This is Gary from Raz Rentals. And today, well, today is my birthday. And because it's my birthday, I decided to take a break from the stuff I've been doing for the past couple months and talk about something amazing. I'm going to talk about the original Playmates Universal Studio Monsters Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, as well as um, the best toy score I've had since 2020. That's right. Two weeks ago, two to three weeks ago, uh, in one fell swoop, I managed to snag a full set of both Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Playmates Universal Monster Waves and also a set of the Star Trek Ninja Turtles. All mint on card, but to be honest with you, not mint, okay? How you might ask? Well, a buddy of mine contacted me, I don't know, like two weeks before before that, to uh, let me know that he was talking to someone locally about picking up some toys, and that if I wanted to, I could come along because he had some old Ninja Turtle toys. I asked him what he had, and that's when he sent me pics of these 12 amazing action figures. For days, it was all I could think about, but the same question kept popping up in my mind. How much would he charge? You know, I was willing to pay a decent amount, but obviously as a collector, you know, you're like, you're hoping to get a good deal. On the big day, I drove over to my buddy's house and we headed on our way to the gentleman's house to uh, find what treasure we could find. My buddy asked me on the way, you know, like, you know, how much are you uh, hoping to spend on these Universal Monster Ninja Turtle action figures? And I said, you know, well, the monsters are worth a decent amount nowadays, but you know, I'm keeping my fingers crossed for like $20 a piece. And then he laughed at me. <laughs> So when we arrived, I asked the dude, you know, how much for the Monster Turtles? And, you know, he told me that he knew that the Invisible Mikey uh, was highly sought after and uh, that he wanted to uh, sell all eight as a set. But, you know, he was like, he was like, you know, just give me an offer. And I was like, you know, that's fine. You know, if you want to sell as a set, OK. But, um, you know, I, I asked again, I said, like, well, how much are you hoping to get for these? Like, how much are you looking for? I like to ask people like what they honestly want. I feel like it's easier for me to work with them, you know, either to um, to haggle with them a little bit or, you know, just to get a good answer, because there's been a couple of times where people have asked me, you know, uh, like like if I went looking for video games at a yard sale and somebody brought out like a bunch of games, uh, they'd be like, uh, you know, make me an offer. And then I'd be like 60 bucks. And they'd be like, oh, OK, OK, you, here, here. And then you're like, shit, I should have uh, offered less than that. So, you know, I, I again, I asked him, you know, what are you thinking? And then he threw out a number. Two hundred dollars for all eight of them. And that's when I threw my money at him. Right. So the Universal Monsters, mint on card, but like I said, not mint, cost me twenty five dollars a piece. And then... I got the Star Trek Turtles as a set for 60 bucks. So all together, I spent 260 bucks on these 12 amazing action figures. It was phenomenal, you know. So in this video, I'm going to uh, review both sets of the Universal Studio Monsters action figures. I'm going to keep Star Trek for um, a, a separate video. And I'm going to um, review these both mint on card and loose. <laughs> that's, that's right. I'm going to open these guys up. And I know you're probably thinking, are you dumb? W what is your problem? And I'll, I'll, I'll explain my reasons why I'm going to open these up. Um, you know, but I, I figured with this video, I could do my best to try to document the packages as best as I can, despite their flaws and the dirt that have sort of gotten inside of some of the bubbles because of the like the little creases or the the hole, the gaps down at the bottom of the bubbles. You know, sometimes dirt and bugs and stuff like that get into them. So, you know, don't feel too bad that I'm opening these up. If anything, I'm sort of salvaging these because I'm going to clean them off. They look a little sticky, too. And then after I get done talking about, you know, these mint on cards uh, and showing everything up close as I can and whatever, I'm going to review the action figures and show up close shots of all the accessories and the uh, the um, the figure sculpts and everything like that, you know. Try to give a nice, like, um, 3D representation of everything. And now I'll give you my reasons why I'm opening these up, you know. In my head, basically, I paid practically nothing for these dudes, you know. Like, I'm not a mint on card collector. Um, so these guys are just taking up space. I don't even necessarily want to stick them on the wall. I, 
I kind of would like to put posters and stuff like that up instead. I've actually already compared uh, mint on card prices to um, loose prices. And the difference from what I saw is basically a few hundred dollars. All right. So, you know, they're still holding their value, even though that they're loose. Uh, not to mention most loose sales don't include like the collector cards. Now, if you think that I should sell these figures and buy loose versions of them, plus potentially more. Well, that to me sort of just becomes like more of a thing, you know, like, like I hate shipping carded figures. I've done it in the past. I always like feel like um, really protective. Like I really have to put a bunch of stuff in there and I always spend a bunch more money than I actually uh, made off of like selling them or like the shipping price and whatever. Not to mention you have to deal with eBay fees and taxes and you know, it could just be like, to be honest with you, it can be a pain in the ass just to find perfect loose action figures. Um, and like even to find the second series with the cards is like very uh, almost impossible sometimes. Not to mention, as I said, you know, some of these cards are creased. Uh, they're a little rough. The bubbles are yellowing uh, because of those cr cracks or gaps down the bottom. I said dirt and bugs have gotten into some of these. So in my mind, it really doesn't bother me to open these guys up. And you know, f to be honest with you, it's just a lot of fun to open up old toys like you used to way back when you were a kid. That's right, I said it. So, uh, you know, enough of that. Now let's talk about both waves of Playmates Universal Studio Monsters, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, geez Louise. The original Playmates Universal Monsters wave was released in 1993 and it included Raph, as the mummy, Leo as the wolfman, Mikey as Frankenstein, and Donatello as Dracula. Now that is a great lineup. No complaints, because obviously these four monsters are Universal's four main movie monsters, right? I mean, the Gill Man, Invisible Man, and the Bride are definitely uh, second tier, even though I might think that the creature from the Black Lagoon, the Invisible Man, and the Bride of Frankenstein may be my favorite Universal films of all time. I think, I don't know, those are the ones that I always kind of want to go back and watch again. Um, I guess Frankenstein 1, too, is amazing, and so is the Wolfman, you know, those are, those are top-notch, too. All four of these guys come packaged on very neat Universal Studios monster cards. Uh, that includes some very cool uh, Michael Dooney inspired art. I say inspired because um, if you look at the Rad Plastic book, this uh, very amazing Rad Plastic book by Chris Fawcett, um, Chris included some very cool sketches by Michael Dooney. Now these sketches were made all the way back in 1990, which is three years before this uh, sub-series got released. At that time, you could tell that it wasn't tied to the Universal uh, license, and um, they were probably going for more of a generic movie monster series, much like the, uh, the movie monsters from real Ghostbusters. Right here it says, could have a bunch of different turtles dressed as monsters. Start with classics, vampire, wolfman, Frankie, mummy, etc. He had a, a gem on the turtle's chest here, he also wasn't sure which uh, Ninja Turtle this was. Right here it says Raphael, get it? <laughs> Mamatello, Tatankangelo, oh boy. And his Frankenstein up here, uh, again, isn't any specific turtle. And it even says, uh, you know, what if Shredder made his own turtle to fight our guys? Dooney's Frankenstein was nude, uh, but some of the details here made it to the, the final design like the elbow and knee uh, joints, the screws there. If you look at the final card art, which uh, uh, Rad Plastic credits to Keith Batchelor, you can see that he kept the pose of Dooney's Franken Turtle, but uh, he adjusted the hell out of it, you know, like he added all those universal Frankenstein um, details. They added the coats and the pants, the boots, and uh, most importantly, the trademark flat top. Uh, even the mummy down here, he kept this like gem wrapped around uh, Raph's neck here. But he added that cool little uh, R belt. <laughs> and you know, it makes you really wish that you could see uh, Michael Dooney's Wolfman art and um, his Dracula. Because, 
You know, his uh, original uh, sketches were a little more detailed than these final pieces are, but these are nice, you know, these are very cool to look at too. This initial series also included a $3 coupon behind the guys, you know, for your next visit to Universal Studios. Wow, that's like getting this dude for free. So the big question for me is uh, why and how did this happen? Michael Dooney did make designs of the Turtles as movie monsters all the way back in 1990. But, you know, they were not inspired by the Universal Studios monster designs. So how did Universal Studios get involved here? You know, I'm not sure. I actually reached out to Chris Fawcett and asked him if he had any idea, but he wasn't sure too. Did uh, Playmates go to Universal or did Universal come to them? You know, that's that's the big question for me. Because in 1994, uh, Playmates released toys for the Universal Studios cartoon Monster Force. That was a Universal's attempt to have a comeback in the 90s, right? And we all know that, like, it takes a while to make a cartoon. So did Universal come to Playmates in, like, 1992 and say, like, hey, we got this cartoon we're working on. We see how you're killing it with the Ninja Turtles. You know, we think that you would be the perfect company to make our toys. Maybe Playmates was like, yeah, we'll make your toys. But uh, we also think it'd be great to uh, make Universal Monster Ninja Turtle mashup toys. <laughs> That'd be amazing, right? We even already have some sketches made up for them. Or, you know, did Playmates bring this crossover idea to Universal, uh, you know, way back when and after Universal and Playmates worked together in a way that made both of them some money? Universal was like, hey, Playmates, uh, we're thinking about making a brand new cartoon. Uh, since we already have a relationship with you, we would like you to make the Monster Force tours. I don't know. I have no idea. If you have any idea, please let me know. I would I would love to know. <laughs> The only thing I really know is that a uh, TMNT co-creator Peter Laird uh, holds the Universal Movie Monster and Star Trek Turtles in high regard. You know, he mentioned a few times on his blog how he thought that they were cool. One example is uh, in his Ask Peter Laird number six post when he was asked what were some of uh, his favorite Playmates TMNT toys. Uh, he responded, I loved the original four turtles. Muckman was cool. Mutagen Man was cool. I loved the Universal Monsters and Star Trek Turtles. Still can't believe we got away with that one. I'd be interested in hearing what uh, Kevin Eastman has to say about them. Although I imagine he'd probably be like, yeah, they're great. <laughs> Another thing I absolutely love about these cards, you know, other than the amazing uh, um, illustrations of the guys is... Universal Monsters. It's just this very cool Universal Studios Monsters logo. Like, that is so cool. Like, um, the underlighting, like, really makes the image pop, but it also helps give the monsters a creepy feel. I think that this is the best Universal Monster logo they ever had. And, you know, I actually kind of forgot about it until I got these. But as soon as I saw them, I, I remembered them being on tons of Universal products back then, like the VHS tapes. One final thing to uh, mention about these guys, this first wave of Universal movie monsters, um, is that uh, they all include very cool monstrous night glow effects. It would have been cool if they would have continued that in the 1994 wave, but whatever. All right, so first up is Don as Dracula, all right? He looks very cool, you know, I like his uh, accessories already. We're gonna take a close-up look at him in a second. But one thing I do wanna mention is all the way up here, this guy was, uh, you know, on clearance for $1.97. Crazy. Can you remember back and then, back how cheap these toys were? And now everybody's, you know, paying hundreds of dollars for them. <laughs> so here's a close-up of Donatello imprisoned in this plastic bubble. The backs of these cards are relatively simple. Um, not much is on here at all. You know, all they they only have the uh, the four movie monsters up top. Here you can see all four of these guys next to each other. It says, uh, "Collect all the Universal Monster Turtles before the villagers run them out of town." Here's Donatello's accessories close up. Uh, you have the batty bow because fangs aren't always enough. The wacky wooden stake for breaking hearts. Wrist wrapping bat buddy, Don's forearm friend, and the cool <laughs> kid sized bat medallion. Uh, be the envy of the evening with this Transylvanian trinket. Just slip a string through the hole on top and wear it around your neck. Oh, I bet that'd be really cool. And here you can see uh, 
uh, Donatello's glow effect. Turn off the lights if you dare and watch Don glow. And all the way down at the bottom, here's Don's bio card. It says Don is Dracula, the fanged foot fighter, vital monsteristics. Uh, we went over the accessories. Favorite movie, I was a teenage mutant vampire. Favorite pizza topping, uh, bloody red tomato sauce. Just like the universal monster Dracula, this turtle has developed an unquenchable thirst for the blood of foolish foot villagers. <laughs> And pizza sauce. Dracula Dawn stalks the old country's sewers in Pizzavania, searching for serious sustenance. And he won't settle for just plain pizza. By day, he's avoiding the sun and hanging with the undead in his Kawabunga coffin. But look out, Foot Clan, because when night falls, this mutant monster sprouts fiendish fangs and begins to glow. And when he turns colors, extra thick pizza crust just won't fill him up. If this campy vampire's on the pepperoni prowl with his wrist wrapping sidekick Bat Buddy, then you can be sure he's hunting that nasty necked Ninja Ninny Shredder. And to really drive home the points, the foot better beware of Drackey's wacky wooden stake. The only thing that can save Shredder and the clan from this non reflecting ninja is a deep dish pan pizza with extra garlic. Got any? Lots of good stuff in there. Moving on. Here is Leo as the Wolfman, and here is a close-up of, uh, you know, Leo trapped in his prison. Now, the uh, the original owner of this actually got this at Clover for $4.99. Now, I forgot to mention before that, you know, obviously behind Donatello, there's the $3 coupon for uh, Universal Studios. But here behind Leonardo, it appears as though there is some other thing in there. I don't know what that is. But when I open it up, we'll find out. What is that pamphlet? Now, uh, one of Leo's weapons here was included, obviously, with Leatherhead. And that's the, uh, the bear trap down at the bottom that I'm sure is not called a bear trap, but we'll find out in a second. And then if you go to the accessory close-up, you can see the Wolfhead Cane for crushing unsuspecting skull brains. Beats barking up a tree. The Fiendish Foot Trap. See, not a bear trap, a foot trap. Uh, for catching the foot one foot at a time, uh, the bony katana, it slices, it dices down to the bone. And the silver bullet shooting gun for the richest shot in town. Now, what's uh, funny here is that this gun here doesn't include the silver bullet. But if you look at the actual accessory, there is a bullet coming out of the barrel. All right. And over here, you can see um, Leo's glow effects. Turn off the lights if you dare and watch Leo glow. Down at the bottom, you can see Leo's uh, bio card. It says, Leo as the Wolfman, the carnivorous canine creature. Favorite movie, I was a teenage mutant turtle wolf. I mean, that's that's cheap. That was pretty much the exact same one as the Don Tell one. Favorite pizza topping, meat, any kind. He's not picky. When the moon is full and the howl is nigh, no foot full is safe from the wolf. The Wolfman, that is. Leo's the scream of the screen, and he's been bitten by the wolf. The Universal Monster Wolfman. And now he's out for meat. Every full moon, Leo changes right before your eyes. Then he bites, if you're a foot fool. Prowling the night like the classic Universal Wolfman, Leo feeds on foot fear, raw mutant meats, and an occasional canine pizza. And when he finds a tasty foot fiend, he whips out his bony katana and cuts him down to size. Never let it be said that Wolfman Leo doesn't have a heart. This howling horror shatters the night with haunting grunting and grisly growling while he mutates from turtle teen into a hairy, fanged, foot feeding fanatic. Just like in the movies, kids. When the sun goes down and the full moon penetrates the thin veil of the night, the foot run for cover and Leo runs for meat. Got any? Man, that was <laughs> a little difficult to say. Jeez Louise. Next up is Mikey as a Frankenstein. And uh, here he is up close in his bubble prison. Uh, just like Leo, this dude was bought at Clover for uh, $4.99. All right. Did not get him on sale, unfortunately. Here's his accessory close up. And uh, to be honest with you, he might have my favorite set of accessories. Uh, you have the bolt-handled <laughs> the bolt handled nunchaku, not just your basic nuts and bolts nunchaku. The pain chain shackle attached to Mike's foot. It shows the horror that once was and the pain that still is. Man, that's deep. The flame and torch club. It's not a secret organization. 
It's a weapon combo nightlight. <laughs> and the beastly beaker holds the life-giving mutant monster mystery ooze safely. All right, and then over here you have Mikey's glow effects. Down at the bottom, if you take a look at Mike's uh, bio card, it says Mike is Frankenstein, the radically rebuilt turtle terror. Uh, favorite movie, The Monster That Ate Pizza. Favorite pizza topping, uh, Monster Mush. <laughs> it was a dark and stormy night. A mysterious figure looms into a laboratory. Some say it was Dr. Splinter. Others say they should have had Splinter. That would have been cool. Others say they never knew Splinter was a doctor, so it must have been some other rat. But anyway, suddenly, as if lightning had struck, and it did, a monstrous mutant rose from the slab. It lives, a voice screams. It glows in the dark. It <laughs> eats pizza. Yes, it's Michelangelo, looking like a real horror show. That's right, scaredy cats. Mike is Frankenstein. Might be the most universally monster, monstrous mutant around. With his bolt-handled nunchaku in his creepazoid hand and pain chain shackle on his foot, he's the most deranged turtle ever to leave the laboratory. When the villagers see this gruesome grunter lumbering their way, uh, it's torchlights and clubs for the lot. But Mike as Frankenstein knows that deep down, he still has a heart. A slightly used heart, but a heart nonetheless. Uh, in the meantime, though, he loves to terrorize and stalk the countryside, just like the classic universal Frankenstein monster, right? <laughs> it's a, you know, monster thing. And last up is Raph as the mummy. Uh, this dude cost $2.99. He was uh, on sale from $6.99. Man, KB was always more expensive than like Walmart or Target or whatever. Um, already I can tell you this. This dude is my favorite in the wave. I mean, come on, he just looks awesome, you know? The almost completely glow-in-the-dark body just pops. And uh, I'll have this dude next to me either at my work desk or maybe by my drum set. Wherever I can see him the most, I'll stick him. You know, he's truly a highlight among these eight figures. Um, what I find very interesting about the accessory lineup, and I didn't really pay attention to the other ones, is that uh, I guess most of them, their accessories came in different colors, and I kind of wish that I would have found him with blue accessories because they look a little bit cooler than the uh, the orange ones I have. Uh, but here you have the two Cobra size because you never know who will be snaking up on you. All right, Stone Dagger for rocking and rolling your way out of the tomb, and that's that originally came with Dirt Bag, and uh, I'll tell you, I'll show you the Dirt Bag version later. Uh, kid-sized Egyptian ring, I don't know, it's a little too small for my finger. A rad replica of the ancient magical king Tutankhamen. <laughs> Down at the bottom, if you look at Raph's bio card, it says Raph as the mummy, the radical wrapped turtle. Favorite movie, Mummy Dearest. Favorite pizza topping, Petrified Pepperoni. Taped up in a pyramid for thousands of years, disturbed by the foul foot. Raph the Mummy lives and breathes, and he's glowing to get out of his tomb and stalk the earth, just like the classic Universal Mummy. Rising from its deep, dark depths, Raph the Mummy climbs out of his sarcophagus in search of Shredder and pizza. And he'll make anyone who gets in his way pay, you know? The cost will be nothing less than one killer curse. And this is a curse that cannot be broken. Except with a pepperoni pizza drowned in, in olives. Ooh, that's disgusting. <laughs> Raph's uh, easily won over with pizza, yes. But he's still scary because he glows in the dark. That helps him uh, see at night. But it's been so long since he's seen the light of day. He may not know what he's swinging at with his uh, cobra size and stealthy stone dagger. So beware. And if you ever hear a mutant moan, you can be sure it's Raph, the mumbling, mummified, monstrous universal monster. Whoever wakes him better have a wedge to serve him, or you will be forever cursed, just like the clan. All right, so that ends the uh, the review of the uh, 1993 figures meant on card, right? And before we move on to the 1994 figures mint on card, we have to look at one final thing. In Chris Fawcett's Rad Plastic book, he also includes artwork of April drawn by Dooney as a cat. All right. Man, my mom would not have let me buy this toy. <laughs> okay. Ah, <laughs> oh, man. 
but later on in 1993, some initial work was uh, done to make this design uh, of April as a werewolf instead of a cat, all right? Uh, but it never got past this stage. It looks cool, but like, I don't know. She's got like a huge head and uh, it's kind of funny looking. I'm not very upset about it not existing in this wave, but you know, it's just, it would have been cool to have it, I guess. I think it also would have been cool to have a uh, splinter as, you know, as Van Helsing, like we got later on with um, uh, NECA or maybe even splinter as Dr. Frankenstein. All right, on to 1994. Excluding April, I like this wave even more than wave one, to be honest with you, right? Um, I don't have any beef with April. Uh, I just like these crazy monster designs way more than her, all right? You know, they appear more detailed than the original wave, and I think Mikey's mix of solid and see-through parts are just fantastic. Like, what an amazing idea an extremely cool looking action figure. Uh, for years, I looked at the invisible uh, Michelangelo and I thought, man, I should get that guy. And then eventually, like, for some reason, they like really shot up in price. and got really, really expensive. So like, you know, he was kind of out of my price range. So I'm so glad this magical pickup happened, you know. Uh, as I said before, I haven't had a pickup like this since 2020. So in uh, this second wave, you have uh, the mutant Raphael. Uh, the Bride of Frankenstein, April, the Creature from the Black Lagoon, Leonardo, and the Invisible Man, uh, Mike. Playmates did a good job making the car design more turtle-esque <laughs> than the first wave. Like, it kind of appears like you're in a, uh, a sewer laboratory. Uh, the illustrations, again, are fantastic, and I especially like the uh, see-through effect on Mikey's hand and head. You know, it's pretty neat how they did that. Just like with wave one, uh, all four of these guys share the exact same uh, card. You know, nothing is different on the front here. Although now, instead of the $3 coupon from Universal Studios, they have these very cool uh, collector cards, which is awesome because these all include artwork by Michael Dooney. Like, that's fantastic. And, you know, another great thing about uh, this cool red plastic book is uh, it actually includes larger uh, prints of... Uh, the collector card art, which is great because now you can actually see them a little bigger and make out the details a little more. And um, if you turn the page, it actually includes cleaner and bigger um, package card art, which is, again, great. It says here that the artwork is credited to Huber, which uh, from the back, it looks like it's uh, Greg Huber. And yeah, it just it's very nice, clean artwork, you know, very cool looking. All right, so let's start with uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Leonardo. Um, just this package looks great, you know. Looks very, very cool. On the side here, it does include the price tag. This guy was, was originally $3.99 at Clover. Um, here is a close-up of uh, Leonardo in his uh, bubble. Uh, the only uh, negative thing I have to say about these guys, uh, mint on card, is that I kind of feel like that... Uh, card should be behind these like accessories like you should be able to make out the accessories a little better um but like i said i guess it is also cool because you can see michael dooney's card art uh whether you open this or not right now on the back things are uh, pretty exciting because uh, i mean look at all those uh action figures uh, included on the back of this thing. They're like, that's amazing. That's so many. It, like the, the most depressing thing to me is that uh, there's just so many action figures here that I don't have. You know, you look at it and you're like, man, I don't have that guy. I don't have that guy. Man, what a bummer. Like you want to hunt them all down. But uh, that's all cool. The uh, Unfortunately, if you look down at the, uh, the accessory close-up area, they only included black and white pictures of the accessories. Bummer. All right, you have the seaweed katana blade, the mucky way to maim the foot, the hideous harpoon gun, the forked spear that looks like fear, um, the terror terran trident. Leonardo commands the lagoon with the swampy spearian tri-tipped staff. And these are like all tongue twisters. Down the bio card, it says a uh, creature from the black lagoon, Leonardo, uh, the swampy, slithery, dripping dude. Um, favorite activity, spear and fish you get in the way. Least favorite thing, being dry. Emergent from the dark depths of the soggiest swamp, creature from the Black Lagoon Leonardo stalks 
onto dry land, searching for foul foot and the notorious Shredder. Leonardo may look monstrous and slimy, and that's because he is. You know, he's convincing. He's been offered a movie deal from Universal Studios. <laughs> that's right! And he could star with his own B-movie mutants, like Invisible Man Michelangelo, the mutant Raphael, and Bride of Frankenstein April. But alas! Creature from Black Lagoon, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Leonardo, is only interested in bringing terror to foot faces. He's dripping with seaweed and loaded with watery weapons, like his hideous harpoon gun. One soaky shot and the foot will know what hit him. Hit them. Hit him. <laughs> For dueling in the depths, Leonardo fishes out his seaweed katana blade, hoping that one jab will make the foot float. When the lagoon's teeming with the terror from the Shredhead gone mad. Leonardo swims swiftly to the top with his terror terror and trident. Creature from the Black Lagoon, Leonardo is one monster who can scare the scales off any fish or foot fiend. Jeez Louise. Up next is the mutant, Raphael. Now, if you try to search this guy on eBay or anything like that, it's very difficult to try to find him <laughs> or even Google because he's got mutant in the name and every time you type just mutant Raphael, you just get everything mutant Ninja Turtles Raphael. Uh, this guy was $3.99 at Clover. Um, all right, let's take a look at the back. Let's see, Monstrous Mutant Weapons, Atomic Double Duty Crab Claw Club. Amazing crab pinchers uh, for double trouble encounters. Subatomic Thermal Forearm Ray Gun. The Mutant Raphael just tightens his muscles and it's disintegrating time. Super Atomic Psy, stick them, then radiate them. So atomic it hurts. Down on uh, the bio card, it says uh, the mutant Raphael, the two hemisphered hero monster. Uh, favorite activity, pension. Least favorite thing, mutant sand fleas. The bad boy beaches aren't safe when the mutant Raphael takes to the sands. See, they're making jokes about him being a crab or something. Like he's not a crab in that movie. Uh, the Foot Clan can run, but they can't hide from this brainy mutant maniac. If the Foot have survived the terror of the mutant Raphael's friends, like Invisible Man Michelangelo, Creature from the Black Lagoon Leonardo, and Bride of Frankenstein Ape, they have to mention them all, I guess it's a commercial within the bio card, then they best get ready for a real radical monster mashing, employing the vice-like clamping action of his atomic double duty crab claw club. Holy crap. The mutant Raphael can dig in deep and pinch with power atomic power. No foot fallout shelter is safe when this menacing mutant stalker moans into town. For quick and decisive battle encounters, the mutant Raphael slices his way through trouble with his amazing super atomic sigh. And to totally eliminate useless foot fiends, the mutant Raphael flexes his forearms uh, forearm and releases a sizzling sting from his subatomic thermal forearm ray gun. The footal wish modern physics wasn't around when the mutant Raphael takes control of the sands and salty sea. Again, <laughs> not a not a sea creature. All right. So next up, the Bride of Frankenstein, April. All right. Here she is in her bubble. This is the most beaten up uh, action figure that I have out of this whole set of 12 action figures that I got. And uh, she does not have a price tag on her either. All right, so on the back, she actually has a ton of uh, cool accessories. Monstrous Mutant Weapons, Electrode Power Switch, just to flip Jolt's juice to bring the monster movie camera to life. Creepy Cracked Monster Movie Camera, now the undead can be on TV. Bandaged Monster Mic for recording experiments or ghouls. Scare away hairspray. Sorry, the pump bottle just didn't look frightening enough. Nasty Ninja Fright Star. Not nice to throw, but very effective. Down on her bio card, it says Bride of Frankenstein April, the reanimated reporter. Favorite activity, getting married. Least favorite thing, Frankenstein monster. Poor Mikey. She's alive and she's going to the chapel. It's Bride of Frankenstein April, the monstrous mate with the tall hair. She's shocked, full of life, and ready to go down the aisle. Nothing will stop her, not even the foot, who are notorious for crashing weddings. Weddings. A squirt, a, squ a squirt of scare away hairspray keeps her hairdo intact and chokes a few footfalls along the way. She can clear a path with her nasty ninja fried star, one stick, and it's stuck for good. Then, if her dear Dr. Frankenstein doesn't get cold feet, he may not, but 
She will, since she's undead. Uh, she'll fire up the creepy craft camera, throw the electrode power switch, and bring her wedding to life. Hopefully, it will be raining outside and there will be plenty of lightning to keep all that going. Of course, Bride of Frankenstein, April's turtle teens will no doubt be there too hoping to sit in the front row the universally monstrous creature from the black lagoon leonardo promises to clean up after himself april knows he can be a real drip sometimes the mutant raphael offered to preside over the ceremony but april wasn't sure if he had the brains to do it and april will no will never know <sighs> april may never know if invisible man michelangelo shows up if candles mysteriously float away, that's a good sign he's there. Sounds like a scary day. Let's hope Michelangelo doesn't catch the bouquet. And finally, we have the invisible man, Michelangelo. Like I said, very, very cool looking, but unfortunately, this guy got hit the worst out of all of these guys with the uh, the gap down at the bottom. Like, there's just dirt filled in the uh, the bubble and just bugs, disgusting bugs. So I will be happy to open this guy up and clean him off. This guy was a uh, 429 at Bradley's. If you look at the monstrous mutant weapons, it says test tube nunchakus for scientific experiments and knocking ninnies in the head. Cold disappear in chemistry set uh, holds the mutant pizza sauce mixture to turn Michelangelo invisible. Bandaged mask with goon goggles. I'm actually I actually think that's one of the coolest things he's got here is that cool bandage head. Without this monstrous mask, you couldn't see Michelangelo. And without the goggles, he can't see you. Um, <laughs> so down at the bottom on the bio card, it says, Invisible Man Michelangelo, this is the disappearing Dr. Dude. Favorite activity, lifting objects and making them look like they float. That's, that's a funny trick. At least favorite things, mirrors. Now, holy crap, there's like a... A huge thing down here. If you can't see Invisible Man Michelangelo, then you've found him. After ingesting his secret experimental cowabunga concoction, Michelangelo disappeared. Now he's a mutant universal monster, terrorizing the foot every chance he gets. He's got help, too, from his frightening friends, the mutant Raphael, creature from the Black Lagoon Leonardo, and Bride of Frankenstein April. Shredder and his very visible henchmen can only guess where and when Invisible Michelangelo and his wacky weirdos may strike next. If they're not careful, the foot could get knocked in the head by Invisible Man Michelangelo's test tube nunchakus. And if Michelangelo happens to get snared once the Foot Clan figures out who's at the other end of the test tube nunchakus, it's no problem. Just a quick whisk in the old cool chemistry kit and Invisible Man Michelangelo can make a ninja noxious smoke bomb. When he's back at the lab, Michelangelo wraps himself up, puts on his bandage mask and goon goggles, and takes a pizza break. A few pepperonis later, though, and he's ready to strike fear in the face of the foot. Fright gags are Michelangelo's specialty, so the next time you see some object hovering, moving, seemingly all by itself, you'll know it's not moving by itself. Invisible Man Michelangelo's just working on a monstrously new parlor trick. So here they are, free from their prison of cardboard and plastic, and ready to... Oh my god! What the hell did I just do? Hundreds of dollars down the drain. How could I be so stupid? <sighs> In all serious though, I don't really regret it. You know, <laughs> it's, you know, it's cool to see these guys mint on the card, but in all honesty, having them uh, mint and loose is just as cool. Well, almost. And like I said, you know, I try to uh, protect the integrity of the cards. I, uh, I cut them with a, a nut exacto knife. That way I can have a nice clean card for my uh, collection. But sometimes these get old, you know, and then the bubble actually just starts to peel off. There's nothing you can really do about it. Now, to begin my review of these guys, I do have to point out that the number of 93 and 94 action figures that I have is smaller than my collection of um, 88 through 92. Like, I have a ton of those, but 93 and 94, not much at all, right? So, you know... Um, I don't know if this is across the board or if it's just these guys specifically, but these guys feel a little lighter and maybe more fragile than the earlier Turtle Toys, especially um, some of these glow-in-the-dark ones, which I think is just because of the material of the glow-in-the-dark plastic, the torso here on Raph and Leo. Um, it feels, like I said, light and almost like it could be brittle. So I've been trying to be extra careful with these guys as I've been moving them around. Even the pelvises... Um, 
I don't know, just feel a little weak. Plus, there's some things going on with the 94 action figures, too, that, uh, uh, you know, I'll point out. I don't really plan on moving these guys around too much after this, you know. I'll probably either put some of them in a box to uh, later put on a shelf or just put a few of these guys next to my work computer. That way I can look at them all day long as I'm supposed to be working. Well, not all day long anymore because I have a full-time job, but, you know, when I'm, when I'm supposed to be working my, my freelance stuff, I can get distracted and look at the amazing creature from the Black Lagoon, Leonardo. So let's uh, move through each figure one by one. We'll start with the 1993 wave and we will begin with Don as Dracula, or as I like to call him, Don Kula. All right, so Don Kula, all right. Um, you'll probably hear me say this a lot during this video, but this dude is a perfect turtle universal mix-up, parody, spoof, whatever you want to call it, right, you know? He's got a lot of the trademark Dracula designs, you know, like the signature tuxedo and the long cape with the uh, very high collar. And he's also got, you know, a lot of the, uh, the, key, <laughs> the key designs of the Ninja Turtles, you know, like the elbow pads, the knee pads, the mask, you know, the three fingers and two toes. I really like um, the use of Donatello's purple, in this design, you know, I think it looks good. And I really like the uh, extra highlights of magenta. You know, those really stand out and, and look good next to the purple and the black. I think overall it makes a very sharp looking design, you know, except for down here. I think I would have left this, <laughs> I think I just would have left that black. It's almost kind of like it's right in your face. Like everything here kind of points right down to the crotch. <laughs> When you start to look at this guy up close, you really begin to appreciate the hard work the sculptor did in trying to make this guy look as much like Bela Lugosi as possible, you know, as if Bela was a, uh, a turtle. Uh, he's got the, uh, the Widow's Peak haircut, and what I think is really awesome is uh, if you look at Donatello's eyes, it looks like he's raising the one eye up, you know, and leaving the, the, uh, the other one down, which looks just like Dracula in the movie because Bela Lugosi is always raising that one eyebrow up to sort of give that, I don't know, is that a suave look? <laughs> so it's really awesome that they were able to capture that on this Ninja Turtle action figure, you know? I think that's a really cool thing. And even better is, uh, you know, Donatello's eyes glow in the dark, right? And um, it reminds you of uh, when Dracula's eyes glow in the film. See that? And then you look at the toy and you're like, wow, amazing. <laughs> I don't know if Donatello wants to suck my blood or try to steal my pizza. The cape looks nice. You know, sometimes he kind of wears like an all black cape and then other times he has like this uh, lighter color on the inside. As I said before, it really has this high collar and I don't believe that you can actually remove this. I've tried to pull it back a little bit, but it seems like it's kind of stuck in place. Maybe you can. No, there's a little pig in the back of his, uh, back of his neck there. Um, and then, uh, you know, to, uh, try to make it look even more like a vampire or bat design, they added these cool, uh, bat wings right here. Donatello wears a medallion around his neck, and it's shaped like a bat. There's a D in the middle of it to, uh, you know, let you know he's Donatello, I guess. Um, it's based off of Lugosi's medallion in the film, but I think that the medallion in the movie looks way cooler than this just very uh, generic bat design. Now here's a fun fact. According to a Smithsonian Magazine, Lugosi was buried with this medallion, or some other one from the film that I guess is just like it. I don't know. I, I kind of skimmed the article. <laughs> you know, poor Lugosi. Uh, he was buried in his uh, full Dracula attire, but supposedly it wasn't his idea. It was his wife and his sons. You know, this poor bastard was typecast even in death. As I said, some of the turtle designs are just the elbow pads and the knee pads. What I think is kind of weird is his shoes though, because if you look at them, they look like um, they're open-toed because they painted them the same color as his skin tone. Um, but these are just supposed to be like closed black shoes. Like there's soles on the bottoms of them and there's no uh, toenail or anything like that. It's just shaped to look like his uh, two-toed foot. But yeah, there's not like anything too crazy about this design. 
you know, he's just got a nice tuxedo. The face looks really good. He's got those huge fangs right there. Um, even in the back, he's kind of got like a stripe going down his leg. And then the, the final thing here is this ring on his finger. Um, Bela Lugosi uh, wore a very noticeably big ring in the films, so it's very fitting to uh, also have Donatello wear a large ring. All right, so Don Kula here has the very basic Ninja Turtle articulation that we all know, you know, it's the same as the figures from 1988. It lasted pretty much through, I don't know, the majority of the line, right? You just have a, uh, a swivel at the neck, the shoulders swivel, you always have a joint in the middle of the arm somewhere, whether it be at the wrist or here, it's at the elbow. The other one, it's like this joint is at the top of this elbow, so he can sort of rotate it a different way. And then this, uh, this joint is at the bottom of the elbow pad. Um, and then you just have like a ball jointed hips. Uh, but as I said, I would be very, very careful with these ball jointed hips. They just feel like a little, I don't know, cheaper or something than uh, a lot of the older Ninja Turtle action figures. Very, very shiny. Very, very cool. All right, so let's talk about accessories. And first, you have the batty bow. Now, this is pretty cool. Uh, there's a nice wood texture on the, uh, the bow part here. And I really like the uh, the bat symbol here, this metallic uh, bat. It kind of reminds me of like a, a candelabra or something else. I don't know, maybe something from church. I don't know, it's hard to tell, but it's a very cool design. I would like to think that these are like sharp so that he could like, you know, hack dudes heads off or something like that. Um, can he hold this? Yes, one handed. Now, the other hand does not look like a good gripping hand because it's more of a pointing hand. You know, it's kind of like that, like, I'm going to get you, old Nina, sort of thing. All right. What's next? Up next is the, uh, the, uh, the wrist wrapping bat buddy. Now, <laughs> this little guy is cool, but, I mean, he's just a bat, you know? There's nothing special about this. There's nothing zany. It's just a, a bat. It's shaped sort of like a ring. Now, I think you, kind of like the mummy accessory, you're supposed to maybe wear that on your own finger. But, you know, you can just put this guy right on Donatello's forearm like that. Maybe he could name the bat Buddy Renfield. Renfield, go get me that damn pepperoni! I'm so friggin' starving! Next up is the wacky wooden stake. And geez, not the smartest weapon for a vampire to use. Like, why would you use one of your few weaknesses as a weapon, you know? All your enemy would have to do is knock this out of your hand and then get you right in the heart. Now, this is pretty nice looking. Uh, it has, again, just like the bow, it has a very nice wood grain on it. Um, there's also R.I.P. written right here on this, uh, on this ribbon. Can Donatello hold this? Yes, he can. And last is the kid-sized bat medallion. Now, uh, despite this not being the coolest thing for a kid to wear, <laughs> it does have a cool design. You know, I like the bat's face. He looks creepy. This is like... I feel like you would tie a string around this and you would run around one day with this around your neck and then it would like get caught on something and then you'd lose it forever, you know? That's what would would have happened to me if I would have had this when I was nine years old. Here you can see Don Kula next to the original 1988 Donatello. So you can see how he sort of progressed in five years. Uh, he got a little taller, you know? This is a, I don't know. Uh, 21 year old Donatello. Um, April's around the same height as him. Uh, even though he is taller, he's still not bigger than Bebop. So maybe he will still look, um, uh, or maybe the villains will still look imposing next to him. And there you can see Shredder next to him. Now I would show you what the uh, NECA Universal Monster version of Dracula would look next to this original 
Playmates design, but NECA has not released a Dracula yet. Now everybody, including myself, I think, are speculating that the Shredder will be their universal Dracula Ninja Turtle mashup, right? Which I think would be very cool, you know, and it would make a lot of sense since uh, Splinter is Van Helsing. Up next, you have Frank and Mike. Uh, again, you know, he's a perfect mix of a uh, turtle and monster. This guy is covered in uh, stitches, seams, um, bolts, or uh, electrodes. Um, now, the paint is a little sloppy on every single one of these bolts. You know, it always bleeds over onto the body. But then, you know, of course, he's got the trademark uh, Ninja Turtle elbow pad and knee pads. Uh, I like how the back of the coat here is ripped so you can see a shell. I think in general, too, um, the sculptor did a really good job of, um, I don't know, making the cloth look at, look like it's draped on top of the turtle body underneath. You know, it has a nat nice natural look. If you look at Frank and Mike's head, you know, he has all the trademark universal uh, Frankenstein bits and pieces. You know, he's got the flat top. He even has the clamps that, uh, I guess, connect the flat top to the front of the skull, which are very noticeable in Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, you have to have, like, this big gash right here on this side of his face to make him look like a Frankenstein. You know, he's got that huge gash. He even has, like, the trademark uh, uh, unibrow that Frankenstein has. And yes, I know, I think I already mentioned this earlier. Um, I'm going to call him Frankenstein and not just the monster. Um, and just, I like the uh, the stitches on his cheeks. Those all look good. You know, as I said, the coat is nice. It's this nice dark uh, charcoal gray color with the elbow pads on top. Um, the pants are a, a lighter gray, but they have rips and stuff like that in it and Mikey wears a belt here with a uh, with the letter M on it, you know, because that's you had to have that on like every Ninja Turtle back then. He even has these giant Frankenstein boots. Now I guess there should be more of a, a platform on the bottom, but you know they're fine, whatever. I think the only like uh, nitpick I have with this guy, I think that they got like hit the body language all wrong or something like that. Like the stance is incorrect because in the movies like. I don't know, Frankenstein doesn't, like, hunch forward to, to grab people. Like, he sort of very stiffly moves around and kind of stiffly grabs people, right, you know? Like, when you think of Frankenstein, you don't think of him like... Like, like I said, he's not hunched. He, he looks like he's got, like, a board shoved up his back or something like that, you know? Um, I can't think of, even in the later movies, him just really kind of hunching over. He just... He walks very stiff, very robotic. Like, if you watch that Looney Tunes with Frankenstein in it... Uh, again, very, very stiff. But, you know, I think the details on this guy make up for uh, my minor problems with his stance. Because I really like the bolts in his neck. And um, even this arm right here, right? This wrist. Like, it looks like it's completely, I don't know, sawed off and then kind of stuck together with these uh, braces. Um, and that just reminds me of the brace that uh, Frankenstein has in the film on that arm. You know, right by that wrist. It's a little different. But I feel like, you know, the way they designed it on this toy is kind of a nod to that uh, that metallic brace in the film. So articulation, again, just like Donatello, very simple. You got the swivel on the neck. You got uh, swivel in the shoulder. You got the two point or the, the one points in the middle of the arm. This one is on top of the elbow pad. This one is also on top of the elbow pad. And then you just have uh, ball jointed hips. And uh, these move around really good. I don't feel like that this guy is going to break anytime soon. I'm not getting too much resistance. And he's also not too loose that I feel like he's going to fall over. It's perfect. All right, on to accessories. And first up, you have the, uh, the bolt handled nunchakus. Now I apologize. For some reason, orange is just always the worst color when you're trying to shoot film. I like these, you know, uh, I like that they're made with bolts and it's got this nice chain going across. Let's see if he can hold this thing with both hands at the same time. Yes, very classic Mikey look, right? <laughs> Next up, you have the pain chain shackle. And, uh, you know, this is pretty cool. 
even though it's a just a shackle with a chain uh, you know it's nice that it's actually built to uh, a piece of a wall and uh, you can see that there are metal plates here connecting the chain to the wall and then if you look on the inside of that wall you can actually see the insides where those metal plates are screwed in place and there's even a uh, like a bolt around the uh, the screws or a, I guess what the hell you call it yeah it's a bolt right I don't remember my brain has gone but even the back of this thing looks nice too because even though it's um, bricks the bricks look like there's like slime or something on them very nice so this thing you just uh, you just put it around his ankle up next is the beastly beaker and uh, you know it's pretty cool looking because it's got like some kind of goo or something like that kind of pouring out the top and pouring down the bottom of the beaker very nice Let's see here he can hold that I like it because uh, you know it looks cool uh, it's sort of maybe it could be one of those things that uh, Dr. Frankenstein uses when he's uh, you know coming up with the body or putting it together whatever you know but I also like it because uh, you could pretend that you know Mikey's Frankenstein from Super Castlevania and he's chucking these at Simon Belmont finally you have the uh, the flaming torch club <laughs> uh, now you may be thinking like geez fire like isn't that Frankie's weakness and yeah, in the first movie, uh, it is Frankenstein's weakness. But in Bride of Frankenstein, Frankie forgives fire <laughs> for burning him uh, so he can uh, smoke a cigarette with the blind guy. So this looks cool. You can fit that in his hands. Uh, his joint is a little loose. It kind of feels like sometimes that just kind of swings down a little bit. Whatever. I would probably display this guy with the bolt-handled nunchucks anyway. Here's Frank and Mike next to a few of the original Ninja Turtle action figures. You know, just so you can see him next to an original Mike plus uh, April and, you know, there's a few villains. Give you an idea how he scales with the rest of the line. And finally, here he is next to NECA's Universal Monsters Ninja Turtles mashup of Frankenstein mixed with uh, Raphael. Now this is cool because you can see that, you know, some of the designs sort of carry over, of course, you know, like the knee pads and everything, but he does have the platforms or the, yeah, underneath the bottoms of the shoes. Um, I like the chain on this guy, you know, there's just, he still has got the flat top. He still has like the clamps on top of the head, the, the scar on the forehead there, just like that guy does. Um, the unibrow sort of look. <laughs> You know, it's all good. I've, I've been, you know, pondering, you know, I think when this uh, Universal line from NECA was first announced, people were like, well, why are you making Raphael? You should be Michelangelo. That's how it was in the original toy line. But, uh, you know, you know, maybe that just has a, maybe that just has a lot to deal with um, uh, Playmates, you know, throwing a wrench in Super 7's gears, you know, like if NECA isn't making toys that are based off of the original Playmates toys, Playmates can't be like, hey, you can't do that. Because, oh, wait a minute, that's not Michelangelo, that's Raphael, you know. He's different enough that they can't say that they're sort of aping their uh, design. All right, so here is uh, Leo as the Wolfman, or uh, Wolfman Leo is how I would call him. <laughs> you know, I think out of all the figures in Wave 1, Leo looks, I don't know, least like his universal counterpart. Um, just because the original Wolfman, you know, he wears all black um, or at least I think it's black. And um, also, like, you know, the Wolfman keeps his clothes in tip-top shape. So when he's, you know, going after women, they're like, hey, you know what? He's a suave guy. Maybe he's not bad. He, he likes to take care of himself. Because uh, if you look at him, he, like, his clothes are in pristine condition. Now, Leo here, there's rips everywhere. Like, his sleeves are completely ripped out. His chest is all ripped out. Um, even on his thigh here, there's some holes. So, you know, this uh, Leonardo Wolfman, Wolfman Leo, he does not take care of himself. You know, he's still super cool. He's just uh, different. Um, yeah, even the back. Tons of rips. <laughs> you know what I, what I honestly really love about this guy is just the crazy amount of texture on his body you know look at all that fur it's just 
it's so well done. It looks so nice. It just kind of looks uh, like realistic or um, I guess plausible is the word, right? Because it, it really like wraps around the shapes of the body in a natural kind of way. Um, it overlaps over itself in a way that just looks nice. You know, it doesn't look messy. It's like, I don't know, eye-catching in a way. <laughs> So, you know, it's, I'm sure it took a long-ass time to uh, sculpt all those uh, strands of fur, but it was worth it on this guy. All right, so let's talk about the uh, the details here, the, uh, the Wolfman and Ninja Turtle details. All right, so if you look at the top of his head, he looks good, right? I like that his bandana is kind of ripped and stuff like that and try to make it look more wild. Even like that really angry expression on his face looks wonderful like he he really looks like he's out for the kill uh what i think is a nice touch is he has like these wolf ears on top of his head but um you know they're pointy here if you ever look at the wolf man in the film though he does not have pointy ears all right so um uh what they did cap manage to capture was the the mouth hair all right because if you uh look here he's got these very large canines on the bottom like of his jaw right um, that's how he appears in the film. The canines, the very long canines are on the bottom and on the top, uh, they're not as noticeable. You know, they're not like real wolves. I think where the, the, the canines on the top are very long for whatever reason, they decided to give him that, uh, underbite, I guess. And, uh, you know, it just looks good on this, uh, Leonardo, you know, as I said in the movie, uh, the wolf man's clothes are, um, you know, they're in perfect shape. But here, Leo, they're all ripped up. He does still have the long sleeve shirt. It's just ripped apart. Uh, ripped apart so you can see the elbow pads and uh, the knee pads he wears on top of his pants here. Um, he just wears jeans, which is good. Plus, you have the belt buckle here with an L. So you know that he is Leonardo. Um... What I think is cool is they actually try to uh, make it look like he has wolf hind legs, you know, where the knee comes down to here and then, uh, you know, it goes down to the ankle and then you have this long part and then the, the toes on the bottom. Like wolves, the backs of their feet, and pretty much all, I think, four-legged animals, they actually walk on their toes, right? Um, what I think is cool in the film is that the wolf man did try to walk like that. He did try to make it look as though he was walking on his toes like an actual wolf. Um, it might look a little more like he's tiptoeing, but, you know, it's the thought that counts. You know, I'm, I'm glad that they, they try to, uh, they try to uh, have that kind of uh, idea in there. You know, I've been wondering as I've been making this video, like who is my favorite universal monster? You know, who has the coolest design? And, you know, in my opinion, it's either, it's between the Wolfman the creature from the Black Lagoon, or the Invisible Man, right? The creature and the Wolfman are, um, you know, interesting because you have to believe that they're fully formed creatures, you know, and not just dudes in suits. And I think that they mostly pulled them off really well. Like, there's only a couple parts in the creature where the, the pants kind of look like pants. But in general, like, the way that they're built, they look very natural. And I don't know, I can lose myself in the illusion that they're actually these monsters. Now, the Invisible Man is easier because he's just a dude covered in bandages, but he, like, appears so creepy. Like, the way that the mouth moves in this scene, I don't know, it just seems kind of strange and unnerving. And, like, I don't know, I love it. Like, it's it's so cool in that movie. All right, so articulation, once again, Leonardo has the same exact articulation as the other guys. You got the swivel in the neck, pretty stiff. You have a uh, swivel shoulders and i i don't know i don't like moving this guy around too much just because i know the torso is made out of this uh glow-in-the-dark plastic which i feel like i just feel like it's thin or something like that compared to the other plastic and i feel like it's like rubbing the the glow-in-the-dark paint here in the shoulders i don't know I, I wouldn't want to um wear it down too much you have a a point of articulation here in the bottom of the elbow pad and on the other side, you have, it's on top of the elbow pad. So he's got, like, the Donatello thing going on. And then you just have uh, ball-jointed hips. 
All right, so on to accessories, and first up you have the bony katana. This appears like a, I don't know, I guess maybe this is a, maybe it's a sharpened bone. And then there's like a femur down here at the bottom for the handle, plus another bone right here going across the hilt or whatever. Um, cool, you know, katanas are cool for uh, Leonardo because that's his weapon. <laughs> I like the spider here, uh, putting the spider web down the blade, you know, I think that is a nice touch. And can uh, Leonardo hold this thing? Yes, he can. Although, the way that this arm is set up, you can't make it look like he's actually cutting somebody. Um, maybe it would look better in the other hand. Yeah, that's definitely better. Whoosh, whoosh. Up next, you have the, uh, the wolf head cane. Now, this design looks even more like a turtle and wolf mix because, uh, you know, the shape of the face is very turtle-esque. But uh, he also has nostrils. The fangs here are, uh, you know, the canines are coming from the top. Um, he kind of does appear like Alf. <laughs> and then the head is connected to this, uh, I assume it's a bone, which goes down to these feet on the bottom. Now, in the movie... Larry Talbot buys a, um, a walking stick with a, uh, a wolf head handle, a silver wolf head handle, right? And uh, you can see that design here. And if you want to, you can come back to the toy and see what it looks like here, all right? So, uh, you know, in the movie, Larry buys this stick as an excuse to uh, talk to the pretty lady who works at that store. Um, the two of them go out on a date, but it's interrupted when Larry tries to save a woman who's uh, being attacked by a wolf. Now, Larry uses his cane to kill the wolf, but uh, he gets bit in the process. And later on, he learns that the wolf is actually a werewolf named Bela. And Bela was played by Bela Lugosi. Or is it pronounced Bela Lugosi? I don't even know. Um, <laughs> now, uh, in this movie, he's a werewolf. You know, he was Dracula. He's a werewolf here. And in Frankenstein movies, he's also a hunchback. Uh, he gets around. So, uh, in the end, Larry's father uses the same cane to kill Larry. Come on, Dad. Like, come on. It's all come uh, full circle. So, uh, Leonardo here, you know, he can either hold it like this, or maybe, just maybe. I don't know. You can try to make it look like he is balancing himself on this cane or whatever, but his hand doesn't really conform to the top of the cane. So, you know, it kind of works, but it doesn't. Up next, you have the uh, fiendish foot trap. And, uh, you know, this looks cool. Um, now, if you ever had Leatherhead as a kid, you have pretty much the same exact thing, except back then it was called the turtle trap. And look at this. I thought originally that it was just going to be like the same mold or whatever, but the fiendish foot trap is actually smaller than this. Everything else is the same. It's like they shrunk the mold down a little bit. Um, so this actually uh, did show up in the film, right? Because the Wolfman steps in a bear trap during the film. All right. So this is a, a nice nod to that scene. And last, you have the silver bullets shoot and gun. Now, like all of Leonardo's weapons here are like, except for the, the bony uh, katana, these are all things that can hurt him. <laughs> Um, this is cool. I like how the bullet looks like it's coming out of the barrel. You know, that's nice. Now, he can hold this thing, but I don't know. Maybe you're supposed to give, like, all the, uh, like, all these weapons that, you know, would hurt the monsters. Maybe you're supposed to, like, give them to the Foot Clan or the Shredder to use. Um, now, the Wolfman was not killed by a silver bullet, uh, in the original Wolfman movie. He actually wasn't killed with a silver bullet, until his third appearance in the film House of Frankenstein. Now, in that movie, a gypsy woman named Ilana falls in love with Larry, but uh, then she learns that he's a werewolf, and I guess, I guess she decides that she wants to put him out of his misery. I don't know. I've seen this movie a bunch of times, but I don't know. It's like she starts making these bullets because only someone who loves him can kill him with a silver bullet. Um... He turns into the wolfman and he goes out on the prowl, but she like goes out to shoot him and he kills her in the process as she shoots him in the stomach, you know. <laughs> you, know you know, I don't feel bad for this woman when she dies because she is a jerk, all right, you know. 
She's pretty shitty to poor Daniel the Hunchback. You know, I'm glad she's dead. Here's Leo next to some of the original 1988 action figures, just so you can see him next to the original Leonardo. Um, he looks good. Now, I would show you uh, NECA's Universal Wolfman, whoever that would be, next to this guy, but unfortunately, NECA has not released a Wolfman. Like, can you believe that? Like, the Wolfman is the top tier of the Universal Monsters. They, they have no mashup yet. Um, now, they haven't released anybody who it might be or anything like that, but in my honest opinion... Who I think would make cool Wolfman or Wolf Men are uh, Ninja Foot Soldiers from the movie, right? You know, because they're already dressed in black. You know, all you got to do is like, you know, give them Wolfman hands or Wolfman feet. Um, give them a couple heads, maybe, maybe some with like ripped faces to show the wolf underneath, or just have like complete wolf heads. So you could make an army of Foot Soldier Wolf Men. I think that actually would be kind of cool. And last, from Wave 1, we have Raph as the mummy, or uh, Raphael, as I think he should have been called. Like, that was such a cool name. Um, this guy is my favorite from Wave 1, and uh, it's not necessarily because of the sculpt. I think the sculpt is well done. It's, you know, it looks good. Um, my favorite Wave 1 sculpt is definitely Wolfman Leo. Um, Raph here is my favorite from Wave 1 because... Uh, his whole body glows in the dark, you know? Um, but unfortunately, it also makes me very nervous because, as I said, with uh, the Wolfman Leo action figure, uh, I feel like this torso section feels very light. And I also feel like his pelvis uh, articulation here is very stiff. And trust me, I do not want to break the legs off of this guy, you know? So I've been trying to move him um, as little as possible. As I said, I really like the glow-in-the-dark look on this guy. I feel like that nice, like, greenish glow-in-the-white, glow-in-the-dark white is, you know, looks cool. And I really like the red right next to that, you know. It's very dynamic. You know, it's a nice mix. Um, of course, you have the R on his belt there. You know, just so you know that he's Raphael. Now, unfortunately, for some reason, like, right out of the box, this guy's face... It looks like there's dirt or something. You know, that's a bummer. Maybe that's like, I don't know, what the heck that, why would that be so dirty right out of the, the box? Uh, plus, it looks like his arms are turning red or are his arms red and then they painted it with that glow in the dark color? I can't tell. It might be an aging thing, which is a bummer, you know? Man, I don't know. He's just, he's very striking and very cool looking. As I said, I like the red. I like that his elbow pads and knee pads aren't segmented like the other guys. Um, they're actually different here. And uh, what I really like is, um, you know, these little bits here where the bandages are removed. And you can see this very disgusting, dried out skin. You know, that's disgusting. There's like these very deep pores in there. Um... <laughs> It really looks like he's dried out, especially on the hand here. That sort of a uh, dried out look is actually in the film, you know, because if you look at the mummy in the Universal movie, uh, you know, in the beginning there, his face looks completely, you know, dried out. And especially when you see his hand and he's reaching for the scroll in the beginning of the film, you know, that reminds me a lot of uh, Raphael's hand here. Um, you know, in all honesty, like I've watched that first mummy movie a bunch of times, but man, it doesn't, for some reason, it just does not register in my mind. You know, I feel like, I don't know if it's the, the most boring <laughs> universal monster movie out of all of them. Like there are some universal monster movies, like I really enjoy and I try to watch every Halloween, but for some reason that mummy movie just does not stick in my brain. Um, and you know, it's a shame because I feel like Boris Karloff's makeup is just amazing. Like look at him in that shot. Like he looks so like evil and uh you know very cool i you know to be honest with you i love those brendan fraser mummy movies those first two movies of the the mummy you know i don't watch the third one but the first two are just they're fantastic i still watch them nowadays all right so articulation once again this guy's got the same deal right you know swivel neck shoulders swivel uh 
This arm is cut on the bottom of the elbow pad. This one is on top of the elbow pad, just like Leo and Donnie. And then um, ball jointed hips. But again, like I said, I try to be as careful as possible with this guy. Try not to push it, try not to strain it at all. Um, that way this guy does not break. All right, so Raphael has a uh, two Cobra size. And these look very good. You know, I like the Cobra design on them. The, uh, how the Cobra is kind of sticking out. Plus you have the metal hilt here, plus the long blade. You know, that looks good. They, I mean, they are very big. Now in the film, like I couldn't find any, I don't know, uh, references to asps or Egyptian Cobras or anything like that. You know, but I guess it just kind of is that like stereotypical <laughs> Egyptian, uh, snake you know you can get Raphael to hold both of these I feel like in this hand you want to make it look like he's about ready to stab somebody and then maybe in this one you can kind of make it look like he's pointing it at somebody you know much like that classic uh NECA cartoon Raphael up next you have the kid-sized Egyptian ring uh obviously this is not going to fit my finger anymore <laughs> uh it's got a scarab on it it looks pretty good I guess now, because I'm an old man and I can't wear this around my finger, you can put this around his wrist, like so. But in all honesty, I am probably not going to leave that on there. It's because I think he looks cooler without it. And then finally, you have the stone dagger. Now, this is the exact same mold, and it actually is the same exact size as the uh, the dirtbag chisel knife, right? Um... You know, it's cool. It's kind of neat having it in a different color, but whatever. Now, in the film, uh, the mummy actually does use a, uh, a stone dagger when he tries to um, sacrifice a woman because his lover's soul is stuck in her body. So, obviously, that looks way more like a stone dagger than this thing. This thing looks, I don't know, kind of like, just like a knife, I guess. All right, so you can get Raphael to hold this thing. He looks like a tough guy, man. He looks like you were walking down an alley and you saw this guy coming at you. would be like, hey, buddy, give me a wallet. Now here's Raphael next to uh, the original Raphael plus, uh, you know, some other 88 action figures. Um, you know, I, I don't know. He's just such a cool action figure. No matter who you put him next to, I don't know. He really stands out amongst the crowd. Now, unfortunately, I haven't been able to open up my uh, NECA Universal Monsters Ninja Turtle Mummy Michelangelo because I haven't made a review of them yet. I'm thinking of making like a simple review of the Universal Monster movies uh, mashup figures just to get them done and over with because they're kind of sitting here. And, you know, I kind of feel like I should focus more on the, uh, the cartoon toys and stuff like that. So I think I just might do something simple just to get them, you know, all done and talk about maybe any interesting things I can think of um, about them. But I mean, look at him next to that guy, like very cool. The, uh, the Michelangelo or the mummy here is Michelangelo instead of Raphael. Now here they are all next to each other. So we can take a look at them as they glow in the dark. Ooh, spooky. Again, Raphael, like, man, I just love that. So here's the Universal Studios coupon. Oh man, $3 off. Good for a maximum of six persons. That means you can save up to $18. Awesome. Now, this uh, thing kind of makes me a little sad though. I mean, Blast Through Time on Back to the Future, the ride. Uh, is that still there? Isn't King Kong and Jaws like definitely not there anymore? Like those were cool rides. Those are like, I don't know, um, iconic 1980s, 1990s. Universal Studios theme park rides, and I don't even think they're there anymore. I'm glad glad that I was able to uh, go in there and see it once in my lifetime. Uh, regular admission is $34 plus tax. What are the tickets now? According to Google, one day pass for an adult is $109 to $159. Man, screw that. 
Uh, this coupon was uh, valid from July 1st, 1993 through December 31st, 1995. I didn't get to go to Universal Studios in Florida until 2002 when I was 18 years old. Um, what was cool was uh, when I went down there, there were still remnants of the Ghostbusters attraction, you know, where they did that like Ghostbusters Beetlejuice thing. That was still down there a little bit, though I think, I can't remember if there were guys dressed up like the Ghostbusters or not. I don't know. I probably have a picture of it somewhere. And the last item included with some of the 1993 figures is this very cool Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles figures and accessories pamphlet that, uh, you know, shows a decent number of uh, action figures from maybe 88 through 93. Obviously, there was a shit ton more than this uh, existed, but... It's still cool when you would get these. I would love to get these like little booklets with the real Ghostbuster vehicles and then it would have like toys of Silverhawks toys and uh, some other things. I think maybe was Dino Riders in there? I can't remember. It's been a while, but I still got them. So this will go with uh, all of those. Yeah. Now on to wave two uh, from 1994. And first up is Leo as the creature from the Black Lagoon. And holy crap, this dude is a standout. Like the detail on this guy is magnificent. You know, he's completely covered in scales from head to toe. And um, I love the way his like larger uh, segments, these like um, these big shell pieces or w whatever they would be. Uh, I don't know. Um, like, I love how they overlap each other, and they look just like the Universal Monster. The face looks spectacular, you know? Um, he doesn't have the pronounced brow that the, uh, the creature has in the film. But, like, I think the mouth looks really good. You know, even the, the wrinkles around the mouth, very fishy. Uh, I love how you have the gills that go from the front of the face all the way to the back which is um, just how the Gill Man looks, or the creature looks in that film. Uh, much like the creature in the film, the pecs here kind of stand out, like they kind of look like pecs. I feel like in the movie they sort of have that look, you know, as well as the other layers around it. And then you have that, like, uh, soft underbelly or abdomen design. Um, on Leo, he's, of course, he's got this... Uh, this Ninja Turtle belt with the L in the middle there. But, like, if you look at the segments on the underbelly here, you know, they match the way that the film looks, you know, compared to the rest of the, um, uh, I don't know, the larger scales or shell pieces? I, I don't know. Um, the arms, you know, just look good. As I said, just just scales all over the place. They're a little maybe rounder than they appear in the film, but it's fine, you know. Uh, he, of course, he's got the fin on the forearm, just like he does in the film. And the hands, you know, uh, they are webbed. His fingers have webbed fingers, just like in the film. And, uh, you know, what I think is a really nice touch here, they could have left this completely blank, but it looks like he's got, like, suction cups on the palm of his hand. Very, very nice. I'm actually really fond of the, uh, the different green for the shell. I just think it looks really nice next to the you know, main green, you have this black. I don't know, like, it almost appears as though there's some kind of silver metallic paint over top of this guy. It's hard for me to tell exactly what's going on here, or maybe it's like a silver wash or something. I don't know, but it's just, he looks so good. He looks very slimy and fish-like. Here you can see the uh, the back of the, the, the creature in the film. And the legs, of course, look good. And uh, here you can see what they look like in the film. Just like his movie counterpart, I can't praise the look of this guy enough, you know. And, and speaking of the movie, you know, it's so amazing to watch those shots underwater, you know. Not only uh, are the underwater stunts incredible, but it also amazes me how clear everything looks underwater with, the, with their, you know, 1950s technology. I guess maybe I might be a little ignorant about what they had back then. But, um, you know, it just, it looks cool. And it always feels like sort of unearthly, you know, watching the figures float in like this large black environment, almost like they're floating in space. Like, I don't know. I, I find it very mes uh, mesmerizing, this movie. Um, and I also really like the effect, like when you actually see the surface and you have that like white um, right next to the black water. Like, I don't know. I, I feel like 
I could just, you know, The Creature from the Black Lagoon is one of those movies where you could just watch it and you're just like staring at the film. Not only that, but like um, all of these universal uh, movies from back then, you know, these black and white films are just really enjoyable to look at, you know, like not only do they have very dynamic compositions, um, but I think the filmmakers, you know, had to try harder back then to show detail because they were only working with black, white and like grayscale. So everything just appears very striking, you know, where I feel like filmmakers, when it became color, you know, they could half ass it a little bit. I don't know. I just you watch these films and even though, you know, things are matte paintings or whatever else, you just you can't help but stare at the backgrounds and think, wow, that's cool looking. All right, on to articulation. And again, this guy is the same as the other dudes. You know, neck swivel, shoulder swivel, which these are fine. Uh, the elbow cut is above the elbow pad. This one is below the elbow pad. Um, the legs are good. I do feel like a little nervous sometimes when I'm moving the legs around. He's not too loose, which is good. I guess because maybe these guys are like more uh, <laughs> high ticket items. You know, I'm trying to be as careful with the pelvis joints as possible. Leo comes with three accessories, and first is the seaweed katana. Uh, this is cool because, you know, it's completely covered in all this detail. Uh, you can see things like a starfish here. I guess there's seaweed wrapped around it. If you uh, There's like shells up here. If you turn it to the other side, you can see, I think maybe that's like a leech, possibly right there. And just lots of little critters or something on here. The handle is nice and scaly, and there's also a shell at the end of the handle. Um, but this is one long ash sword, you know, because this is like as almost as long as his whole body. Let's see. I know I could get him to hold this, but now I can't get this stupid sword in his hand. There we go. So he can hold this perfectly fine. Up next is the Terror Terran Trident. Uh, another nice weapon. You know, it looks like it's built out of different pieces. Um, maybe this is wood down here, and then you has got a bunch of shells right here. And then you have the trident, the blades up here, um, or spears. Uh, there's a shell right here. I think one of the funniest things is, uh, you know, obviously this has some turtle gross-out humor. Because there is a fish impaled on one of these uh, trident spears. Poor little bugger. And uh, Leo can hold this too. And last is the hideous harpoon gun. Now this is great. This is hilarious. Um, it's made out of a long fish. You have the fi fish head up here. Uh, you got a fin here, then the body comes around. I'm not sure exactly if there's like a brace or something attached to it. And then it comes all the way down here where you have the fishtail. Or, you know what? This was a fishtail. I'm stupid. <laughs> so he must have... He must have decapitated this fish. and Put the tail on the back of this. But this one, you know, hopefully this dude is dead. Hopefully he doesn't have this, you know, harpoon sticking through his back at the top of his head. Getting ready to shoot some guy. Just be careful when you pull the trigger. Now this is the only item I think that Leonardo has that really relates to the film. Because in the film... There is a harpoon gun. It looks nothing like this, but it's there. Um, and as you can expect, the creature gets shot with this harpoon gun. Leo can, in fact, hold this harpoon gun, so that is good. Here's Creature from the Black Lagoon, Leonardo, next to the uh, Wolfman Leo, plus the original Leonardo and some other guys. Uh, man, I don't know. Leonardo might have the the most detailed figures out of all of the uh, the Ninja Turtle Universal movie monster action figures. Now, there is no NECA Universal mashup counterpart, unfortunately. Uh, I don't even know who they could make into the creature from the Black Lagoon because I don't think Danny or Kino are cool enough to pull it off, all right? I said it. I don't care. Um, so maybe they will have to start, you know, recycling Ninja Turtles. Um, you know, maybe you could go outside the movie-verse. Maybe... I don't know. Maybe you could make Slash into a creature from the Black Lagoon, but Slash in movie style? I don't know. Up next is the mutant Raphael. 
a Metalunian mutant to be precise. That's from the movie This Island Earth, and uh, this figure, just like Creature Leo, is a highlight in my opinion. Though. To begin with, the, the design is a classic 1950s science fiction design, which I love, and I think it perfectly mixes with uh, Raph's face here. You know, it's both hilarious and unsettling. <laughs> like, look at him. He's kind of freaking me out. Check out that brain on his head. <laughs> the veins are all painted nicely on this thing, you know? They look good. I love how the uh, the green of his face fades into that like peach color of the brain on top. That's good. Another really cool looking thing is, um, you see his eyes, you know, he's got like the turtle mask, right? And you have like these big bulging, you know, silver eyes. Well, there's like a, there's a, some detail here to make their, it look like there's lines on the mask, which actually makes it look like the eyes of the mutants in the film, The Silent Earth. You know, it's very cool. It's really nice how um, they were able to work that detail into this in a, um, in a creative way. Now, the paint on this guy looks okay, but, uh, you know, in the film, these guys are like a teal color, you know? Um, this guy obviously is not teal at all. If you've never seen This Island Earth, a uh, real, real simple explanation is uh, some aliens from the planet Metaluna come to Earth looking for atomic scientists who can help them turn uh, lead into uranium. You know, they need it to protect their planet, which is under attack by another alien race, okay? Um, eventually, they take two scientists to their home planet, um, and we get to see this mutant there, you know? Um, the mutants are simple-minded beings. The Metalunians use them as, like, slaves or something like that. Um, according to Exeter, the one Metalunian, uh, they're kind of like insects or something like that of this planet. Or maybe he says, think of them as insects, like there's not much to their consciousness or something like that. You know, they're given orders and they just kind of follow them. Of course, this one mutant goes nuts, or I guess kind of maybe it forgets its prime directive or something like that, its orders, and uh, it attacks the scientists as well as Exeter, this Metalunian. You know, as I said, that's a very basic, very basic description, and I left a ton out because uh, there's a lot more to that movie than just that, all right? Um, eventually the Metalunians want to come to Earth. You know, that's their plan. They want to leave their planet and come to Earth and sort of take over. Um, now, you would think that uh, these mutants, because they're used in the promotional photos and they kind of appear everywhere for the movie, um, you would think that they would be heavily um, included in the film, but they're only... This one mutant is only on there for like six to ten minutes, and that's it. You know, it dies pretty quickly. I originally thought that Exeter and the other Metaludians were going to reveal themselves as like being like wearing disguises or something like that. And that, you know, that mutant form was actually their real form. But no, nope, it's not. You know, they're just human-esque with gigantic foreheads. So this guy has a sort of like an insect carapace for a body, you know, except he's got lots of veins. I think he definitely has more veins than actually appear in the film. Um, in the film, his forearms are a lot longer, you know, that are connected to those um, insect claws. They are not crab claws, but uh, here you can see Raphael's got those, you know. Uh, one of the biggest differences is just the detail on the back. You know, here you can see Raph, it's just got like this carapace or this shell going across his turtle shell. In the film, it doesn't look like that at all. It uh, almost looks like he's got like a jetpack on his back. Now, here is one of my uh, huge moments of frustration when I open these guys up. Um, look, he is missing his bandana. That was not included in the box. Can you believe that? So now I gotta, like... Now I feel like I have to hunt down, like, a, a mint one. <laughs> like, son of a bitch. Can't believe it. So, uh, in the film, uh, you know, the mutant wears pants like this. Uh, I feel kind of like these look like uh, sweatpants, <laughs> which is just kind of hilarious. Like he's got just like this bathrobe wrapped around him with an R on it. And he's wearing a little bit of sweatpants. It's like it's like at the end of the day of uh, working in the mutant mines or something like that. He just comes home and he's relaxing. 
Uh, in the film, like I said, he wears pants, and I learned from uh, a video by Johnny Back. <laughs> it's B A A K. Uh, the video is called "Everything You Need to Know About This Island Earth, 1955." Uh, I learned from watching that video that originally the mutants had legs. Um, that matched the top, but they were, I don't know, problematic or something like that. So they decided to give them pants. Now, I never saw this movie before I decided to make this review. Um, and uh, after I watched it, I actually really enjoyed it. Although I don't really, really remember much about it. Other than, I love the uh, 1950s Technicolor. You know, there's just some scenes in that film that look so cool. And it's all because of the color. There's also really nice uh, shot compositions here or there throughout the film, um, which is a plus, you know, because it's that also makes it enjoyable to watch. I feel like a lot of the backgrounds look very 1950s sci-fi, which is just, I don't know, there's something about it that seems appealing to me, you know. Uh, I think the, one of the biggest highlights, other than the mutants design, is the matte paintings. Some of the matte paintings in this movie are just beautiful, you know. Um, like, that shot looks wonderful. And uh, I also love this shot right here. I completely miss matte paintings in movies, um, and I wish that they would make a comeback. Now, one thing I heard was uh, the mutant design in this film actually inspired H.R. Giger whenever he was designing the alien, which I don't know if it's true or not, but, you know, I feel like that's pretty interesting. I feel like there's a little bit of a similarity or something like that. When I look at the Metalunian mutant, all I see are the uh, the aliens from Arlia in uh, Dragon Ball Z. You know, I feel like maybe uh, Akira Toriyama was inspired by their design just a little bit. <laughs> At least the faces or something. Um, and I also see the uh, I think they're I think they're called the Sabai Man, Sabai Man. I can't remember. It's been a while since I watched TBZ, but yeah, I also see those guys too. And then, of course, you know, he's got, like, these giant pincher, pincer feet um, that he has in the film. All right, now on to articulation, and here is where I had some problems, all right? Because, look, his head is so loose on the body. Um, if you have one of these guys and uh, you have this loose problem, let me know. Let me know it's not just mine. Um, but, yeah, his swivel is kind of at an angle. Um, the shoulders swivel. I always like when you get toys like this and you always like try to match it up perfectly with the uh, the other bits. Um, the elbow joint here is on the bottom. This one is on the top of the elbow pad. Um, and then well, the other problem I have with this guy is the pelvis joint. I feel like it's sort of loose. I feel like there's like a little bit of a snag on the ball when you're trying to move the legs around. It really worries me to move this guy around because I do not want to break this guy. He's just too damn cool. Um, so, yeah, he's got some problems, but he's still just an excellent figure to uh, look at. All right, Raph comes with uh, three accessories. And up first, this is a very long accessory, uh, is the, uh, the Atomic Double Duty Crab Claw Club. That is a friggin' long name. Uh... This is uh, really nice. I really like how both claws are different from each other. You know, it, they could have went uh, the lazy route and just made them both the same, but they made them different. So that is cool. One thing I should point out is there's uh, atomic or atom symbols on this thing. The only way I think that you could really get this guy to hold this, and you could try if you wanted to, to get it around this thicker middle part. Which, I don't know, I don't necessarily suggest that. I feel like it's better to go onto the um, the ends like that because they're thinner and you won't be putting any stress on that claw. And I really like that uh, 50s ring design, you know. Next is uh, the uh, Subatomic Thermal Forearm Ray Gun. Jeez, another long name. This is very nice. Again, I like this, uh, like, the ring design. I don't know. It appears very uh, 50s, almost like a 50s ray gun 
So that is cool. You can clip this thing around his wrist, like so. And finally, the last accessory is the Super Atomic Psy. Now, I'll be honest with you, this thing almost looks like a... like a spaceship or something like that. Like, it should be like, shoo! <laughs> um, the design is cool, very uh, futuristic. Once again, there is an atom symbol on the, uh, I guess, the hilt or the... I don't know, the, what do you call that part of the of Psy? Um, and then you kind of have like these two rings right here on the handle. Getting him to hold this thing is not easy. Um, I've been doing this. Just kind of putting it in the claw like that. Because you can't really wrap that claw around the handle at all. I thought maybe you were supposed to put it around this bit right here. And I couldn't really get it around that either. Maybe you can, but I don't know. As I said, I don't want to stress anything or, you know, cause any problems. Here's the Mew and Raphael next to, uh, you know, some other figures. The original Raphael plus the Mummy Raphael. Uh, you know, obviously there is no NECA Universal Ninja Turtle crossover figure of this guy. Um, but he, uh, he looks very cool next to these. You know, this is a cool set of Raphael action figures. Um, not as detailed as the Leonardo ones, but still very striking, very cool looking. Um, definitely action figures. If you can find any of these Raphaels, you need to pick them up. Next up, you have Bride of Frankenstein, April. And you know, she's okay. I don't know. My mind is kind of fixated on the monsters at the moment. <laughs> like, I can't, can't be distracted by, uh, crazy undead women and pea-stained dresses i mean it, look that's what kind of looks like all right like you know the bride it's, the bride wore a completely white dress and for whatever reason they decided to put hues of yellow on here and it just looks like it's stained with you know maybe she left it out in the cat heat on it or something like that you know just like the other figures i do think they did a good job mixing the um bride of frankenstein design with the april design it's just, I don't know. There, you know what? She's got some leg problems because you can't really move her legs around. So sometimes she falls over. Um, you got to try to balance her on the dress that actually lays on the ground. You know, that's not present with the other uh, figures in this line. So from top to bottom, you can see here that they gave her the bride's trademark crazy beehive. Like she stuck her finger in an electrical outlet or something like that. Um, when you come down, you kind of get the white dress like the bride wears. You know, in the movie, it's just completely white and, like, completely covers her body, except for her arms are wrapped. And, um, this figure, you know, her arms are wrapped. So that's cool. But then as you get down to the dress, some of it is ripped off, and then you get some of April's, um, yellow jumpsuit. Uh, this is pretty interesting, too, because... Like, back here you have some stitching going up the back of the leg. And then, uh, you know, what's very different for April is she has green, well, one green knee pad right there. Um, so, I guess she's getting, uh, she's trying to be like the Ninja Turtles, I guess. Um, but yeah, like, the articulation, like, you know, she's got mostly the same stuff as the guys. Like, her head swivels, her shoulders swivel. But then you got like, uh, you know, you got the one cut in the middle of the arm. Same thing over here. But then down here, the legs, I think the leg might rotate a little bit up here. Like there's a swivel. It's not a ball joint. But I don't know. It's like her feet are completely planted flat like that, you know. This foot actually does have a, a cut, like a boot cut right there. But this one does not. So, like I said, it just can be tricky sometimes trying to get her um, balanced on your table. You know, after that, there's not really much more to say about this uh, figure. You know, The Bride of Frankenstein is an excellent movie. I think The Bride is pretty cool looking in the movie, but it's just a very simple design. You know, there's not much to it. So, I don't know. There's not much to this April action figure other than, you know, what I went over. So now let's talk about April's accessories. Her accessories are okay, but I think most of them are oversized. Like, they're just way too big. She's got little tiny hands, and, like, 
all the like the grips or the handles for these are way too big um so the camera's cool because it mixes sort of like the you know the bride design by having these wraps around the handle uh while also having these like turtle shell designs on the sides of the camera this is the creepy cracked monster movie camera because i guess it's cracked right here where the videotape is um, this thing right here is the uh, electrode power switch. But it's just a big piece of wood. It's connected with this um, wire. Now, if you actually looked at the back of the card, the camera originally was on top of like a bow or a staff or something like that. April can hold both of these items at the same time, which is good. But, you know, as I said, it can be a little tricky getting them into her hands, especially this handle right here, because she's got such a tiny grip and that handle is huge. I don't understand the purpose of her having to hold both of these at the same time. I mean, could you imagine if you were trying to shoot with this video, this, first of all, this gigantic video camera, and then with your other hand, you're holding up this, you know, wooden power switch. You'd probably be shaking, you know, as you're trying to use your muscles. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to keep it steady. Next is the bandaged monster mic. Uh, you know, again, this thing looks gigantic compared to her. Um, but you know, it's wrapped right here. You have the, you got the mic on top and then down here you have bolts, you know, so it's Frankenstein themed. There you go. But look at that tiny grip, giant microphone. I don't know. It just looks like it should be to a, a bigger toy. Here we have the scare away hairspray. Um, again, this thing is just gigantic. It looks way too big compared to her body. Um, down here it's wrapped, you know, just like the Bride of Frankenstein is wrapped. Right here it's actually uh, etched. It says uh, Scare Spray. You know, it's okay, but I don't know. It's just gigantic. And I think the way that she has to hold it is very strange too because you have the wrapping or the bandages down at the bottom and then a little bit of that comes off to the side and then you have this like huge ass cylinder <laughs> and you're supposed to uh, stick that into her hand like this. Who is holding hairspray like this? It looks weird, but obviously you can't fit this gigantic thing into her tiny little hand. So I guess that's the best they could do. And finally, we have the Nasty Ninja Fright Star. Again, this thing is like way too big. It's <laughs> like, it looks okay. I kind of feel like the design looks more of like a flower than it does a ninja star. You kind of have the wrapping in the middle here to try to make it look like the Bride of Frankenstein accessory. But I don't know. It doesn't look like a weapon. It looks... I just see a flower when I look at it, all right? Um, the way that she holds it is weird, too, because you have this little peg underneath like this, just like the hairspray. Um, and you just stick that into her hand like so. I don't know. So that is it. <laughs> Here's April with a few other Aprils. I mean, they pretty much have the same body. And um, a, a few other uh, figures from the line. Now, even with her crazy hair, Mutant Raphael is still taller than her with his gigantic brain. And here's the Playmates Bride of Frankenstein April next to the brand new NECA Bride of Frankenstein April. Um, after 30 years, the only one of these characters who stayed the same universal monster is April. Um, you know what I think is pretty funny? is I think this Bride of Frankenstein, April, the likeness of the face, I think, is better than the actual movie version that I have, like the movie toy. Uh, maybe the paint is better on this. I don't know, but to me, it looks just like Judith, only with blue skin and uh, crazy hair. And finally, we have one of the coolest Playmates figures of all time, Invisible Man Michelangelo. Now, I'm sure a lot of people out there would say that he is the best monster Ninja Turtle mashup. But for me, it's between him and um, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Leo. Leo for the detail and Mikey here for the cool use of translucent plastic. Like, why are the translucent toys so damn cool? They just look so amazing, you know? Uh, once you get past the plastic, there's some real nice spots on this sculpt. Uh, right off, you know, I think the back of this guy is, like, amazing. Like, it looks so natural and cool how the, um, the fabric drapes over the shell. Um, very, like, realistic. 
And I think that they could have left the back of this guy, you know, just like a smooth back with a, a subtle hint of a shell. But like, I don't know, the detail here is very well done, you know, it's very impressive. You know, I think that's just such a nice uh, detail on this guy. All the wrinkles look good, but that shell just looks spectacular. Like, you actually believe that there's a hard shell underneath that uh, coat of his. So, let's take a closer look at this guy. The head here looks great. Um, the translucent plastic has sort of an orange tint to it. I'm not sure if that's how it was always supposed to be, or um, it just became orange after being in a hot attic for, you know, 20 years. But either way, you know, it's fine because it fits Michelangelo because, you know, orange. I think the expression is good. He's still got this, like, you know, grating teeth kind of look on him. He looks very stern. He looks like he means business. Um, you know, when you compare him to other Ninja Turtle toys, his head is a little smaller, but that's because um, it needs to be smaller so you can put on his uh, bandage mask with goon goggles. Now, you can... Uh, there's the back of the head, just in case. This thing goes on easily enough. You know, there's a hole here in the back where you can fit his um, bandana. Like so. It conforms to his head uh, really well. And then the front of it just snaps into place. Very, uh, very easily. Now, his head looks good like this. You know, I think it... I like he's still got the... The, the grating teeth right here. That's hilarious. You know, it looks good, but I also kind of feel like the um, the shape is a little rounder than usual. Almost kind of makes him look like a frog. Like, I feel like he, if he was green, he would look like Kermit. Um, the goggles are uh, pretty neat looking, you know. They definitely have um, that look that the Invisible Man has in the first movie. He's definitely not as creepy as uh, Griffin in the film. You know, in the film, I love that, like, fake nose and the tufts of hair. You know, I like when that super annoying woman walks in on him and he's, you know, already removed half of his bandages. Like, we all know how, um, what the special effect is that's going on here. Like, how they're making it look like, um, it's see-through on the bottom. But, I don't know, it just looks creepy and looks excellent. You know, this figure, like I said, doesn't look as creepy. I also love in the movie whenever he pulls off his fake nose and his goggles. Like, that looks cool. And um, there also is this uh, bandage head whenever he's like, you know, in his smoking jacket or his, uh, his his lounge coat or whatever you want to call it. I think that part's awesome because just when he talks, like the bandages move in a very cool kind of unsettling way. Um, I think that this head is obviously supposed to be the original head, but he doesn't have like the fake nose or anything like that. That would have been funny if you would have just had like a little green circle right here. Mikey wears a long trench coat, but um, I think in the film, the only time the Invisible Man is wearing uh, a coat is during the scene whenever he checks into the inn. I think most of the other times he's just kind of dressed up in his, uh, his suit. Um, I like the color choices on this guy, you know? Um, I like the lighter blue next to the, uh, the navy blue. I think that looks good. And it just makes the orange pop, you know, because they're complementary colors. Uh, his tie looks good. I don't think he wears a polka dot tie at all in the movie, but I think it looks fine here. Right down here on the pants, there's a tear and it's painted black, you know, so it's supposed to look like it's see-through. I actually think that they could have left that... Maybe, I can't tell. I think it's painted black. But I was going to say, I think that they could have left that just the clear plastic because I... Believe this whole leg is um, molded out of this clear translucent plastic, and they just painted that. I think you know having the one translucent foot and the one translucent hand is very Ninja Turtle esque. You know where it can't be the same on both sides. I mean, even this uh, like I don't know. It doesn't necessarily look like a rubber glove. I think it's probably more of a, a leather glove. It just looks good. You know, it looks like a glove. It doesn't look like his regular hand. And then this one looks like his regular hand because it's got fingernails. Um, and the last thing is, um, you know, I really like this um, two-toed shoe. I think for whatever reason, it just looks really cool and kind of interesting. All right, on to articulation. And, you know, this guy is actually different than all the other figures. I guess maybe not April, but, you know, most of the Ninja Turtle figures. Because uh, his head swivels back and forth, you know, just like they usually do. The shoulders swivel. 
just like they usually do. And then the uh, this one hand doesn't have a cut in the middle of the arm. It's actually just his wrist, his wrist turns around. Um, this hand is actually cut above the elbow pad. And the biggest change here is the legs. They are not ball jointed. They actually are swivel. So, kind of neat, kind of interesting. And that is all. Now, on to accessories. And first up are the uh, test tube nunchakus. Now, these are cool, you know. I think the test tubes look kind of neat. They still have, like, these bands around them, I guess. So when you're putting them into something, they hold in place, I guess. Right? I don't know. They have these little tiny pegs down here at the bottom. And that'll make sense in the future. It looks kind of goofy just having it like this right now, but... Once I show you what you can do with those, you know, you'll be like, oh, that's kind of neat. Um, I like the tube down here. I like how you have the one going straight and then the other one wraps around it. I think it's uh, sculpted to look pretty cool. Now here you can see Mikey holding the test tube nunchakus. His grips are a little tight, but you can still get them in there just fine. Next is the cool disappearing chemistry set. Now the detail on this is really nice, you know, like there's some, uh, maybe some buttons down here, some knobs. I like how this uh, flask, like it's actually on fire, you know, to warm it up. I like the little twisty tube that comes down here to this piece, which uh, I cannot read what this actually says. I believe it says like, it looks like E-A-U-D-E -E, uh, invisible, but you know, it's hard to read. And what's kind of neat is you can actually remove that piece. Um, so you can get a, a better look at the rest of it. This uh, flask right here, it looks like there is a hole in it and some goo is pouring out of it. I even really like how this tube right here twists around into this uh, test tube right there. I don't know. That I think that is all pretty neat. On the back, you know, it's just more of the same. Not much more detail. Um, as I said, this flask right here, it's cool because it goes up really high and you have these two little bits that come out at the top. It looks like the uh, liquid inside is overflowing. You know, as I said, it says something invisible, but I can't read it. And if you were curious, yes, you can get Mikey to hold this one big flask. Um, the neck of this flask is a little thick, but you can, you know, find a place to uh, grip it in the hand. All right, so as I was saying, you know, with the test tube nunchakus in this uh, cool disappearing chemistry set. Now, he's the only uh, figure in this set where you can actually combine all of his accessories for the full effect. You actually put these um, pegs into the top of the flask here, and, you know, they don't really go in. That one went in fine, but this one always, like, pops out. See that? I try to push it in as hard as I can, but it just slowly starts to work its way back out. But here you can see it all together, and, you know, I guess it looks cool. I think it's fine. <laughs> it's a little big and awkward, but uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't know if I'll display him holding any of these accessories. I just kind of like having him, you know, bare. <laughs> just, just Mikey by himself. Here's Invisible Man Michelangelo next to an original Michelangelo and, of course, his uh, monster brother, Frankenstein Michelangelo. And here's Invisible Man Michelangelo next to the brand new NECA Invisible Man Donatello. And man, you know, Invisible Man Donatello looks fantastic. Like, I cannot wait to open this guy up finally and uh, take a look at him because he's just so neat. And I think the... Um, the bandaged face looks very, very similar to that original Playmates action figure. This Invisible Man Donatello is also wearing a trench coat, so maybe I missed a scene or two where he's actually wearing one. All right, and the final thing to really mention about these guys are the trading cards. Now, these are cool. I will probably remove the plastic and then put them into um, my binder with all of my other Ninja Turtle cards. The backs just say, you know, the bio from the backs of their toy or their action figure cards. And the front, you know, just features the really awesome Michael Dooney artwork that, um, you know, if you uh, if you get the Rad Plastic book, you can actually see um, bigger versions of these illustrations. But these are really cool, you know. I, 
I don't really have any other of these trading cards because, you know, as I said before, I don't really have many Ninja Turtle figures from um, 93 and up. But, you know, it's it's a pretty cool thing to have, I think. Now, looking at this uh, Invisible Man Michelangelo card, it kind of makes me wish that they would have, like, included some kind of see-through uh, nunchuck. That's really awesome looking. Here's all the monsters next to some of the nastiest and creepiest Playmates mutants that ever were, you know. <laughs> you know, you think uh, maybe Baxter's telling everybody, I'm based off of somebody in a movie too. Here they are with some other monster toys I had from back in the day. I thought it was important to show them next to the real Ghostbuster monsters because for me, they're like the only ones that I would have had as a kid. The Ninja Turtle monsters are probably a little cooler, but I don't know, I always loved that um, real Ghostbusters Wolfman. That was always a cool toy to have. And that's it. You know, in true Gary fashion, this video took way longer than I expected. Um, I thought it was just going to be like a quick thing where I reviewed the guys, but once I started going into all the details and decided to show screenshots from the, the actual movies, you know, the time just <laughs> gets bigger and bigger. But it was a lot of fun, so, you know, uh, I hope you enjoyed watching it. You know, thanks everybody out there for being so patient with me as I've been uh, sort of busy doing other things for the past couple of months. Um, after this... Uh, there should be more reviews coming up, hopefully sooner. <laughs> so talk to you later and have a good one.